Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Verse and Stars podcast. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. And remember, click that subscribe button. It's an amazing episode because Eric Powell boards the Mueller ship. Know him as the creator of the Goon, Hillbilly, and the founder of Albatross Funny Books. Come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Powell. Thank you so much for coming to the Verse and Stars podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's totally my honor. Like I said, I've been a fan for years for quite some time. I love the goon. So, and thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you. So we start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love of comics and who are your earliest influences? Uh, earliest influences. Um, I think the, the first artist that I knew by name and could recognize their work was Bernie Wrightson. Mm. Um, I remember seeing his uh, Swamp Thing comics um, early on. And uh, again, not being able to put a name with, you know, the art necessarily, uh, but later on seeing some of his other work, uh, seeing his art book, a look back and going like, oh, that's the guy who drew Swamp Thing. <laughs> so uh, he's the first artist that I knew by name. Um, but uh, I was a Marvel kid growing up. Uh, so there was a lot of, you know, the the 80s, um, early 80s, late 70s uh marvel artists uh were really what you know uh got me hooked on comics as a kid so what was the comic that made you think that you yourself will can become a great artist oh i don't know <laughs> it's usually the other way around it's usually <laughs> uh uh look at this great comic that makes me think uh i stink um, <laughs> um i remember uh the, the some of the comics that really made me want to do comics were um uh some early dark horse stuff uh, i went over to a friend's house uh when i was in junior high and uh i think junior high might have been high school but anyway um went over to a buddy's house and uh hung out and he had somehow gotten a copy of uh hard boiled uh the frank miller jeff Darrow uh, book and uh he also had copies of uh the first alien versus predator which blew my mind because mm -hmm. i i lived in a pretty rural area and you know so the the majority of of comics that i could find were just stuff off the spinner rack you know mm -hmm. so it was just marvel in dc um and then, you know, I saw this comic. I was like, they did what? They did a comic book where Alien fights Predator. You know, it was, I couldn't believe that was happening. So um, that was pretty wild. But uh, Hard Boiled was the book that was like, you know, holy shit. I can't believe they are, you know, uh, someone's doing a comic book like this. And it, it really, you know, opened my mind up to what was possible in comics. Um, that it wasn't just a, you know, a superhero genre that, you know, you could do any kind of idea. Um, so I think that book really uh, set off my imagination. You know, what's kind of interesting uh, when I listen to you talk um, that you've had such an amazing career and it sounds like you still once in a while get imposter syndrome, which from, from my angle, I think myself, <laughs> how is that possible? <laughs> you've been you know, like said, such an important part of the industry for many uh, decades now. I think I think a little bit a, a a a little bit of imposter syndrome is a healthy thing. I think people need to keep their egos in check, and you know I I I also know I I I think you have to be your own worst critic, and know your limitations. And there's a lot you know like you you always have to be, at least for me. This is how it works for me. It may work differently for other people, but for me I. I in order to push myself, I I need to, you know, criticize myself and, and see, you know, like pick out the things that I could have done better. And, uh, you know, I tend to compare my work against other, uh, works and, uh, I tend to judge myself probably <laughs> a little harsher than the other work. So that kind of happens, but yeah, I mean, I, I definitely still, I mean, I, I, 
keep thinking that the bottom is going to fall out any day now. It's like, everyone's going to wake up and go like, Oh yeah, that guy's not that great. <laughs> um, I mean, it happens in the entertainment industries all the time, you know, where someone's the, you know, flavor of the month. And then all of a sudden tastes change and, you know, they can't get arrested. So I, I don't think I'm, I'm uh, any exception to that rule that any day, you know, I could, you know, not be as popular. So it just mm. happens. Well, your um, imprint, uh, your comic book, um, Albatross Funny Books, was creator owned. Now it's becoming an imprint of Dark Horse. So, what mm -hmm. led to that decision? Uh, a lot of factors led to that decision. Um, I left uh, Dark Horse um, for a lot of reasons, um, and uh, just felt like it was time to to go out on my own and start my own thing. Um, a lot of those reasons uh, why I left Dark Horse uh, have changed, and I felt like the company was going in a good direction. And uh, on my end, I was just getting extremely tired. <laughs> it, it was uh, a lot of work. It was very rewarding. Uh, I had a great time doing it. But um, when you're trying to produce several books and run to run a publishing company at the same time, um, that's it's a lot to to handle and uh i was getting severely burned out um uh it just it was it was the right time to to make the move back and um uh dark horse was extremely receptive to the idea of me bringing everything over and uh turning uh, albatross into an imprint which you know definitely helped me make that decision um so yeah, I'm super excited about uh, what the future is going to hold. We're still kind of gearing up um, uh, and putting our slate together for when we really launch, but um, I'm very excited. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Like I found out, I think, about um, Albatross coming to Dark Horse around the same time that I heard Yusagi Ujimbo um, by Sansa Kai was coming back to Dark Horse as well. Is Dark Horse mm -hmm. like changing a perception to bring back some of the more of these imprints that have that left um i guess in, in the 2000s uh i don't know if if that's the case if they were you know actively pursuing anything i think um dark horse just always leaves the door open you know uh when i wanted to take off you know it was a very um we left on you know we, we parted on really good terms i didn't you know burn a bridge and they definitely didn't either um it was just kind of uh i think i needed to move on they were disappointed about it but understood and uh you know uh remained uh you know very professional about it and um when you know they things uh as i said all these things started happening where it it became uh a better idea to go back you know that door was open and they were very receptive to it so um i mean for my part i i don't think they were doing anything to actively pursue me to get me back in there mm. um but uh they were definitely very open to the conversation so being an imprint how does that or how is that going to impact the publishing of the abatross titles well i mean i'm still pretty much the uh, i'm the as far as Albatross goes, I'm the creative uh, decision maker, I guess you would say. Uh, I'm kind of bringing books uh, there that I want to do, stuff that I'm going to do myself, stuff that other people are going to do. Um, uh, Dark Horse is, is pretty much giving me, you know, free reign to, to continue to do what I was doing. Um, within means you know i'm if i'm publishing you know five books myself at albatross i'm not gonna show up there and go we're gonna do 30 you know <laughs> um I'm, I'm keeping you know we're, we're still gonna do just a small amount and try to maintain a, a focus on a few titles rather than a lot so books published by uh, albatross funny books included hillbilly uh galacticon goon tank girl will all these books follow to the new imprint well, uh, Tank Girl, King Tank Girl was a, a, a one-off, and I think they've gone back to uh, Titan. Um, uh, but our current titles, our current trade paperbacks are 
are being sold through um dark horse right now so hillbilly galacticon um all of those things are are being sold through dark horse right now um we're kind of like as i said we're still kind of building our uh uh release plans and figuring out uh where to put some of this stuff um so you know it remains to be seen what the what all <laughs> will be releasing in the future yeah. So, so when you're thinking about the imprint of for Albatross as as far as not only uh, on on its own but also for Dark Horse, what do you consider an Albatross style book? Like when you think of like what your imprint is and what a book belongs under you and and your imprint name, what like what are you thinking about? Like what what things are considered? Well, all of the books that we released through Albatross, uh, they only had one specific uh, criteria, and that was that I liked them. <laughs> Uh, and so I guess, you know, my, my tastes tend to be a little quirkier, uh, than normal. So I think, um, the kind of quirky kind of, uh, not necessarily art driven, but really strong cartooning, really strong, you know, uh, uh, storytelling in the art. Uh, I think those are the kinds of things that I, you know, gravitate towards. So that's, those are the type of books that Albatross was publishing for sure. So the last time the goon and hillbilly were seen was in Albatross exploding funny books. Number one. Mm -hmm. um, so when can our listeners see a return of these characters? Uh, we're working on it. Um, uh, again, we, we haven't uh, announced any, you know, new projects just yet. Um, but uh, goon and hillbilly will be, uh, you know, priorities coming out through Albatross. And um, we will be picking up those storylines that were left off in Albatross Exploding Funny Books number one. So I know you can't give away any spoilers or in, in, that, in, in the big plan, but when you, these stories do continue, are they going to continue in ongoing series, you think? Or are they as part of the in, in an anthology as, as they were in the previous um, Exploding Funny Books? Yeah, explaining funny, but it was it was a good experiment. I, I thought it was a good idea to keep our titles out there uh, more consecutively. But um, anthologies are a hard sell, and um, uh, the idea of doing a, an oversized anthology, um, I wanted to test it out. I wanted to see how it did, but uh, it it underperformed my expectations. Um, so I don't think we'll be releasing them again in an anthology. Um, they'll be their own. They'll definitely be their own series. So like I said, I mean, I, I love Goon. I, I remember, I think when I first purchased Goon, it was the issue. I can't remember the exact number, but when Goon uh, teamed up with uh, Hellboy, I think it was like issue like six uh -huh. or seven. I've been buying Goon like ever since yeah. then. And it's such a wonderful title. And I think it's one of those titles that I think no matter what kind of mood you're in, it always works because, you know, it has a little horror, it has the humor and everything else. It always seems to work. So in your opinion, which I, and I think Goon is your probably maybe your best known character. Um, I mean, it could be Hillbilly, but it's probably Goon. So why do you think the Goon has caught on so well? Well, I think at the at the time it came out and it's not so much the case anymore, but at the, when the, at the time it came out, there was really not. Uh, a whole lot of option on the comic racks there. It was mostly, you know, um, superhero stuff and, and uh, not a lot of uh, uh, weirder books out there. It uh, You know, there was stuff being done, but it was, you know, uh, a little bit more underground. And I think um, one of the reasons that the goon took off was because it stood out amongst that stuff. Um, but today there's so much uh, interesting and weird material being put out that, you know, um, it's a much different landscape than when I first launched the book uh, in the late nineties. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, that, that had a lot to do with it. The fact that there weren't a whole lot of books out there like the goon that kind of, you know, played around with genres and humor and everything like that. And now, you know, there's just so much, uh, I mean, you go into a comic shop now and it's just the rows and rows of great ideas being done by, 
you know, extremely talented people. It's it's a great time for comics. Mm. So when you when you're thinking about writing your stories for the goon, are you thinking? Were you thinking about a particular character? Was there a particular storyline popping in your head? Was it something you were trying to say? Like what led you writing particular stories for the goon? Uh, it really came down to what I wanted to draw. <laughs> I I like drawing, uh, you know, depression era kind of uh, raggedy worlds and. Uh, I like drawing um, ugly people <laughs> and monsters. <laughs> so that's kind of uh, where the goon came from. It was it was mostly just me wanting to do something that really played to my artistic strengths, uh, which were ugly buildings, ugly places, <laughs> ugly people and monsters. So, yeah, I think but that's where <laughs> it came from. <laughs> When you think about it, like when you say like you love writing like ugly characters, is that is something you're trying to say? Is, is that like a statement about people and characters? Like, you, or is it just you just they just more fun to write to draw? Well, I mean, it, there's a little bit of both there. I, I think uh, you know, uh, the typical you know good looking character is always kind of boring to me. <laughs> Um, I would prefer something that was, you know, had a little bit more character to it. And uh, so, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I when, even when I'm sketching, I don't draw like a handsome person or, a, you know, a, a, a good looking uh, lady or something. You know, it's always uh, some decrepit guy that looks like he just <laughs> fell out of a bar, you know. <laughs> And, so and that's I, I was saying, and I, and I think one of the best buddy team ups really is Frankie and the goon. They are they're so wonderful together. Is that <laughs> like, how did that, that, that just naturally come about? Was there something about Frankie that just seemed to fit perfectly with the character? Yeah, <laughs> they are, uh, they're pretty much an archetype, you know. the Definitely in, in more classic material, there's always, you know, the big guy and the little buddy kind of thing going on. Like, uh, you know, an old Warner Brother cartoons when you have the big bulldog and the little yappy dog that's hopping around him. And and even like the, you know, the Andy Griffith show between Andy Griffith and Barney, you have that kind of uh, dynamic going. And that always appealed to me. I always I always liked. I always liked uh buddy movies and and uh stories about friendship and uh i always like the dynamic uh, visually and mentally of the big guy and the little guy um so that you know that's where that came from for the most part just that kind of classic so is frankie then uh the goons robin <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, it's completely different uh, uh, kind of scenario and relationship. But yeah, it's that, uh, you know, that uh, that buddy that uh, the main character needs to either, you know, call out their faults or uh, that the main character needs to uh, steer in the right direction. I think one of the great one of the more fun characters that came out of the Goon series is the buzzard. Is there a chance we're going to see him again? It really depends on if a story comes to me because uh, uh, I I feel like I took the character in a, it, it, to the end of its um, thread mm. where, you know, I this character is a character that can't be killed and ends up becoming this... Um, personification of the grim reaper and carrying people to you know the other side um there's not a lot you can do with that once you know it, it, unless you're going to do a more um fantastical type story something along the lines of sandman or something where you have a character that uh kind of straddles those worlds but um I won't. I wouldn't say no. It would just depend on whether or not a story comes to me. I, mm. I tend to not uh, do something like, "Oh, people like Buzzard. I got to do another Buzzard story." Where 
you know, I, I write things and bring back characters because I get a story idea, mm. you know, rather than trying to cater to, uh, you know, uh, the fan base. A lot of the great characters have come out of Goon. As we mentioned, Buzzard is the zombie priest. There's Duck Boy. All these characters I think your fans want to see more of. And can, is there some hope down the line that we will see even more of those characters as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, the next uh, storyline, um, uh, the kid with the duck plays a, a very big part <laughs> in the uh, in the plot of that one. So he will definitely be um uh in a surprising way he will be a very big part of that are you able to give an idea of when we, we're going to be seeing more is, uh, issues of goon like are we looking at months or years oh i would say months i don't think it'll take years to get a, another uh, uh goon comic out oh very cool good um another thing that people have been talking about for a long time um there's almost a, it's almost mythology now around it is the goon animated film and the last mm -hmm. I read, it was being streamed, going to be streamed on next Netflix. So, what is the current status of the Goon animated film? Well, I can't really talk uh, about it at this time, <laughs> but uh, we're still working on it. Um, Tim Miller is still uh, plugging away. He's been a bulldog on this thing, um, and I want to let everyone know that uh, it. it I believe it's going to happen. If you actually see a goon film on your screen at any point in time, you need to thank Tim Miller because he has been fighting nonstop for the last 10 years to get a goon film made. And uh, if it happens, it will be thanks to him. So I, I know you'll be careful what you say, because once again, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of contractual things going on. So mm. but I'm going to, I guess, push just a little bit on it. Or when you say it's in a, some form of production, are we talking about it's already been, contractually that it's going to get made and it's just imagine a print in production or are we still in the discussion stage of whether whether it will be put into production i can't really speak on it at this time but uh yeah it's still inching forward um i, I know you probably can't answer this but i'm gonna try anyway if you don't mind okay. uh because like I, I just love the goon um so when we talk about the film is it more likely going to be an origin story based on a previous story or br something brand new uh, it's it's based on the comics. Um, the we're not uh, recreating the um, you know the world. It's uh, definitely you know altered to fit a film format. Um, but the characters from the comic are in the the film. Another cool thing I think about the goon is that goon also has an action figure for as it's from Grindhouse Toys. How cool is it to see yeah. the the goon toy? <laughs> <laughs> it looks awesome. Oh, it's yeah, it's awesome. Um, Mezco uh, did a goon figure. Did I think four goon figures uh, a long time ago? That was really cool. Getting to see a, you know, uh, that was the first goon action figure, the Mezco uh, version, and uh, that was just really neat. It was really cool to hold a figure in your hand and go like, wow, that's a thing I made. You know? <laughs> so I guess the real question then is for your figure, are you talking mint in package or do we take it out and put it on like a stand somewhere? Well, because they send you a few of them, you know, you get a few copies. Of course I have, you know, I, I kept one of everything in the box and then I, took another one and opened them. So I think I actually have like two or three that I opened because I just like, Oh, this one's different, you know, whatever. Um, so yeah, there's some around my office and stuff. And yeah. I think another cool thing that, that you, that you've done of late is that you've been doing some political cartoons. Is that something you're going to build upon and do something um, more regularly? Or that's something that just you felt, you felt in the moment you wanted to do. Yeah, it's just in the moment. And honestly, they just come out of frustration. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, it, it, in some ways, it's therapy. It's just getting like, oh, I'm just, you know, just getting something out of my system so I can just chill out and move on and work on something else. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of the, of stuff going on in the world to keep me pissed off. So I'm sure I'll do more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, are you considering it all collecting them sort of like a, one of those like far side collections where people can buy them and have 
um uh, i guess it'd be almost a page by page reminder of how bad things have sucked in <laughs> uh i don't know if i'm gonna do enough of them to collect it if i ended up with enough i probably would just because why not mm. um but it, yeah it would depend on how how many i actually ended up doing so another thing that you worked on that's really cool is that you worked on a a book called did you hear what eddie uh, guy uh, guy done with mm-hmm. Howard, I'm gonna get the last name wrong. Schechter. 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 Thank you. So I know. I know so I saw the name. I was like, yeah. I'm gonna blow it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, did you hear what Eddie Gein done? You're not working with Howard on a new nonfiction book. Um. So mm-hmm. how does this partnership work between the two of you? Uh, we have a really good partnership. Um, we uh kind of uh, with this new book, it was a little bit different than uh, the Gein book because. Uh, he had already written uh, what is considered the definitive work on that case. And uh, what we did with the new book, we just kind of like took new information that he had, had gotten over the time because he had written that in the eighties. Hmm. Um, so that, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, came to light during, you know, between that time and uh so we were able to pretty much go from his original work and just add to it where with this new book, we're kind of doing research from scratch. So we're both, uh, we both kind of just dove in and did a bunch of research and then, um, uh, our work, our, our method is, uh, kind of where Harold will go through and kind of compile and kind of start to direct the, um, the topic and, and do a, uh, an outline. And then I'll take that outline and start, you know, adding to it and kind of breaking it into a comic script format. And then we just kind of go back and forth, uh, refining it. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, a uh, it's quite a bit different than working on a, a fiction comic book because of all the fact checking and everything you have mm. to do. So it's, it's a lot more work. So when you think the thing with writing a nonfiction story is that honestly you're constricted by truth, which which, mm-hmm. which is going to be a complicated thing. When when you're creating a book, what are you determining truth versus maybe um, entertainment, and do, do they ever get in the way of each other? Well, the personally, uh, the the only time I'm uh, adding anything into uh, uh, these uh, books that's not factual are just story devices to help the narrative move along. Mm. Um, In the, in the Gein book, we introduced uh, a couple of um, characters that that were kind of amalgams of other people. Um, And we also, we put that in the notes, you know, that these people didn't exist. They were invented to help the narrative move along. Um, But for the most part, I try to be as, as factual as possible and of course it's it's impossible to be 100 percent factual because you know we weren't there you know we <laughs> we did not see these events and unless there's you know uh audio or video recordings it's hard to you know definitively say that uh this is 100 percent accurate <clears throat> but the best you can do is you know gather the information that you have and try to tell an honest you know story without any bias so when you're reading something like once again nonfiction, is it more difficult to include everything or is it more difficult to take things out and and drop them from your story for me it was more difficult to not include things uh i i went down a lot of rabbit holes on the gene book because you know I, I would just get sucked into it and you start you know going through newspaper articles and you know your timeline and everything and it's like where was he between the time when he, they had him in the jailhouse and they took him to the courthouse how how much time did that take and you know everything and and then you start to realize no one cares no one cares <laughs> about this thing that you're you know you're you're spending hours and hours trying to figure out some minute little thing that's not going to make it into the book and no one cares about. And I, I caught myself a few times doing that and going like, okay, stop, you know, this is dumb. Well, I can't imagine it must be difficult to, when you take something out of 
a story. Once again, this is based on a true story, wherever it is, and um, something that really happened. When you pull, take something out, is there ever a concern that you're pulling on a thread that if you don't know that this, the reader doesn't know about this event, that makes this event more difficult to tell and that take, you know what I'm saying? And then the rabbit hole on that spirals and spirals. When did you know that you, you can take something out without worrying about understanding the next thing after? Well, that, I mean, that's all part of building the narrative. It's like you, you, you kind of, you have to work in broad strokes and then refine it. And you gotta, you know, you gotta know this is an important part of their life. This is an important part of their life. This part of their life ties into this next thing, you know, and it's like, once you have the broader strokes in there, you can refine it, start adding the minutia back into it, uh, of, you know, uh, their life um is you know you just have to maintain the focus of not adding too much that it distracts from those big tent pole moments hmm. now i've had the pleasure of interviewing a few people doing uh, do documentaries and one thing I, we've talked about is that when you're looking for truth in, in a real story there's a question of perception of truth and where that truth is coming from how do you kind of suss out what is probably real and what was and happened to what may have just been you know saying hearsay or thought about what happened but not may not be as accurate right and unfortunately with the the game case there is a lot of misinformation out there i mean and it's pretty easy to um to figure out what is misinformation and what's fact you know uh there's <laughs> there's a lot of uh um stuff out there and some of it in books that seemed um uh like they would be legit you know but then once you start researching the case and, and it's like you know they say things like he had a refrigerator full of blood like a you know vials of blood like a vampire or something and it's like well he didn't even have electricity <laughs> so why would he have a refrigerator you know, mm. stocked full of human meat and all this stuff, you know, and there's just a lot of that. Um, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the cannibalism aspects of, of Dean, um, I would say it's implied a little bit. Like if you really get into it, his, ex when, when he was asked, uh, if that was, uh, something he partook in, his answers were a little sketchy, but that those are the that's the only thing that links him to any type of cannibalism. Mm. And, you know, the, he, if you ask anyone, any random person, it's like, oh, yeah, he ate people, you know. <laughs> so there's a lot of there was a lot of misinformation and hearsay um, in that case. But it, luckily for us, it was pretty easy to uh, especially when you have court documents and, uh, you know, stuff from the actual forensic hmm. uh uh searches and everything um i mean it's pretty straightforward what was uh in his home and what he did hmm. so what can you hint at about the topic of the new nonfiction book uh i'll just say that it does deal with true crime again but uh, it doesn't only deal with true crime. So <laughs> there, it, it, this this one has a lot of uh, interesting aspects to it. Is this going to be a subject matter that your readers will be familiar with, or this is something that we most readers would not have um, an understanding or not understanding of knowledge of? I think uh, I think they'll be very. Uh, aware of this subject matter okay <laughs> <laughs> i think they'll be very aware of it but uh we're going to present some information that i don't think they probably have can you say that this is from recent history or distant history depends on what you mean by distant um <laughs> without aging us both too much let's say older than yeah. 50 years yes older, older so than it is, 50 years it's older than 50 years all right, yeah. very cool. And you, you're you're doing the artwork for it as well as as writing it this yes. one as well. Very yes. cool. What is the timetable that our listeners can probably see it? Uh, hopefully, uh, early next year. Um, I'm hoping that we can get it out around then. 
when, when might you be able to drop details about the subject matter? <laughs> well, I mean, as soon as Dark Horse makes an announcement, um, people will be ready to know. But I don't know what the timetable will be. Um, as far as, uh, you know, getting it into the system where we're have, you know, set up with printing and everything. And then, uh, you know, Dark Horse has a, uh, you know, a method of when to announce things versus their release date and everything like that. So are you able to say, is it distant enough that the people involved in the book are still alive or not still alive? Probably. Um, some of them are still alive. Yeah. Does that, does that complicate things when you're writing of people who may be able to comment, claim, or whatever? No, I don't think so. I, I again, you know, uh, as long as you get your facts straight, you're telling an honest depiction of something. I think you're fine. <laughs> I, I gotta get more information. On this. Well, I'll have to wait a little bit, but I definitely want to get more yeah. information. It sounds fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> So, what what was what else, what other things are next for you? How do you um like what other projects are coming down the pipe for you? Well, I mean, I'm I'm pretty busy with that, and um, uh, you know, the projects, the, the couple of other projects we have coming up from uh, Albatross. So that's been taking up the majority of my time. Very cool, Mr. Powell. It's been an absolute honor to speak with you, sir. And when you're ready to talk more about this book come back on i would love to just will do thank you thank you